Hi, it's Stacy from Tamarack Nature Center, part of Ramsey County Parks and Rec. I'm here to introduce a very special guest and a special feature, a sneak peek into bird banding. What is bird banding? Well, it's done by licensed ornithologists where they catch and release songbirds and fine straight nets. They catch them, uh, are trained to get them carefully out of the nets, weigh them, figure out whether they're male or female, how old they are, and then before they release them, they put a, a lightweight aluminum band around their right ankle. And on that has a number on it that is entered into a database that's uh, national. Now, why do we do this? Why go to all this trouble? So that you can figure out where birds live, where they migrate to, and what is their habitat. Because through bird banding, we have found a lot of the same birds are caught over and over in the same places, whether it be their summer ground or their wintering grounds down in the southern United States. So it gives us ammunition to make sure that we save our green spaces and these habitats for our birds. So can anybody do it? No, not at all. We need to have years and years of training to get a permit and to get a license to do something like this. Well, we're very lucky that we get volunteer Jeff Port from Bethel University to come to Tamarack every summer to help with summer camps. Well, we got a sneak peek from when he was at Beth, when he was at Rum River Central Park in Anoka County just the last couple weeks. Check it out. So one of the things that anyone who has a license to ban birds from the federal government has to be able to do is we have to be able to identify at a minimum at least three different things uh, on birds. We have to be able to identify what kind of bird they are. Uh, so is it a blue jay, is it a robin, is it a, a common yellow throat, uh, whatever it may be. So that's one thing. A second thing we have to be able to identify is how old it is. Uh, and there are a number of different ways that we can do that. And then the third thing we have to be able to identify, uh, if, if possible, is we want to know the sex of the bird. So we want to know, is it a boy bird or is it a girl bird? Uh, and so in this case, um, we have a number of tools that we can use to be able to help us with that identification. Um, we should be able to identify the species. That's part of the... The, the information, the knowledge that you have to have before you're given a license to be able to ban birds. Um, but the other two pieces are a lot trickier. And so we actually have uh, uh, information that helps us with that. Uh, this is a book that I use. Uh, it's from uh, a book by a man by the name of Peter Pyle, uh, who's put together an identification guide for these different species that we have here in the United States. And it helps us with some of this information. So for example, with a blue jay, um, there's a number of pieces of information that are on this that can be very helpful. So we can see that uh, there are all kinds of characters over on the left-hand side. So things like feathers, one that's known as the alula, uh, and uh, coverts, and the color of the mouth, or the color of the eye, uh, that uh, might be useful. But then also we can identify, and it might be a little hard to make out on the camera, but uh, we can identify age-based characters. So. What are they when they're a hatching year bird or born that year? What, it, what are they uh, when they're a second year bird um, or born last year? And whoop, what are they if they're older than that? So it turns out that in most birds we can't know if they're older than two years. That's the, the oldest we get. There are a few exceptions to that. Maybe if you know bald eagles, you might know that it takes about five years for a bald eagle to get its white head and its white tail. So you can actually tell the age of a bird farther out. But with something like a blue jay, we really can only know was it born this year, was it born last year, or was it born some point before last year. And so we use all these different types of characters to be able to identify the age of the bird. Uh, and in most cases, we can do that pretty consistently. Um, in some cases, it can be really difficult to tell, uh, but we'll save that for another time. So one of the most important things that we do when we band, uh, and of course, actually the primary reason we band, is to be able to put um, these numbered aluminum bands on the legs of birds. So there's a number of different kinds of bands that we use, but these particular bands fit on the leg of a bird, 
uh, and they're each uniquely numbered. So this is a relatively large band that you might be able to see the number on, but each of these bands has a number, uh, and they're issued to me as a part of my permit from the federal government. Uh, the information that we collect, including the band number, will all go back to the federal government, and it's publicly available. Uh, in fact, if you ever have a bird that hits your window or perhaps is hit by a car and you, f and you happen to stop and look at it and you see that it has a band on it, if you collect that information, you don't have to take the band off, just simply write down the number that's on there and then go on to uh, the Bird Banding Laboratory's website. There's a spot there where you can enter the information, the band number and where you saw that bird, uh, and it will not only tell you what information we have about that bird, where it might have been banded, where it might have been caught again at some point over the course of its life, but it's also really important information for the bird banding lab and for us for research uh, and for conservation purposes to be able to know what happened to that bird. So I'd encourage you to please, if you ever do find a bird uh, that has a band that has been injured or has been hurt uh, or killed, uh, to write that information down and just take a couple of minutes to report that information on the bird banding website. Uh, but what we do, back to sort of band sizes and different types of bands, is every band has an individual number so that when we put that on the bird, it's going to stay with that bird for its entire life. And anytime we catch that bird again at some point in the future, whether it's here in Minnesota or whether it's somewhere south of us, if they're migra migrating and they've gone to Mexico or maybe Central America or maybe South America, wherever it may be, uh, we can learn about where that bird has gone as a result of the information that it's carrying on its body. And so uh, as a part of that, we want to make sure that we're using the right size because just like you and I, we have different size legs, different size fingers. Birds have different sizes as well um, based on the size of that bird. And so this is a band that might be used for a a larger bird, maybe something like a, a green heron, uh, but we also have a variety of different sizes of bands that we use. And so in the kit that I have here, um, you see a number of different sizes. So we have some smaller sizes uh, like this, for example, which is a band size two. Uh, and so just for comparison, right, you can see the difference between a larger band for a bigger bird and a band size two. This size band might fit on a blue jay or perhaps a robin. Um, and then we can go even smaller. Uh, and so we have things like band size ones, which are used on things like oven birds and indigo buntings. And so every bird um, has a, a certain size leg, and we want to make sure that we're putting the right size band on those legs before we let those birds go. Well, we have a blue jay in the net, and uh, we're using a mist net. For those of you that don't know and haven't seen before, these are called mist nets, M-I-S-T. Uh, these particular nets uh, are named because they're very fine mesh and so they're very difficult for birds to see and so we hang them in places where birds are likely to be flying. Uh, we're not using baits, these are not traps in the traditional sense uh, where there's something to attract a bird here. Uh, they're simply located in places that banders think birds are going to be passing through and so you might be able to see in the background this is located uh, parallel or I should say perpendicular to the shoreline of a small pond here. So as birds work their way back and forth along the edge of the lake, uh, they encounter these nets. And so uh, we have um, caught a nice blue jay. He's not very happy with us at the moment, but we're going to try to take him out as quickly as possible. So one of the first things when we remove a bird from the net uh, is we have to decide which side the bird came in from. And so that's a really important part of, uh, of banding to make sure you can remove the bird quickly and safely, because uh, ultimately we want this bird to be removed, uh, banded, and we'll show you how that works in a little bit, but uh, done in a, in a way that's safe and then ultimately uh, let that bird go. So uh, in this case, I know that this bird came in from this side. Uh, I'm using some specific holes on this bird. It's tangled around its wings, and so I need to uh, get the net off of its wings, which I'm doing right now. I've got the bird out at this point, and uh, there he is. So. We're going to go ahead and show you some uh, banding and uh, how we go through an age and sex this bird uh, as well as we already know what the species is. So we'll do that in a little bit. All right, so we have brought our uh, blue jay back to our banding area. Uh, and so we've set up an area where we have our bands, we have uh, some information uh, that we use to identify uh, the bird and the sex and the species um, and the age as well. So we'll kind of walk you through that, but um, we actually keep the birds uh, in these bags. Uh, these bags are made to be able to hold the birds safely. It keeps them calm 
and so uh, they're able to, to certainly breathe and, and move around inside the bags. It's a little bit like uh, maybe uh, pulling the sheet over the top of your head uh, while you're sleeping at night. Uh, keeps them uh, feeling a little bit secure as well in there. So the bird is sitting very cal calmly in here, uh, and I'm going to go ahead and reach in and pull out the bird. Uh, and as I do that, you'll see that I'm holding the bird. There's a couple of different ways that we can hold these birds safely. Uh, again, uh, a lot of uh, what we do, uh, we want to make sure that we can handle these birds safely, release them safely, uh, and then hopefully catch them again, either here uh, in Minnesota or perhaps somewhere else in the country for our migratory species, uh, because we're able to learn quite a lot about um, about bird behavior and about bird biology uh, through banding information. So if we put a band on a bird and then release that bird and that bird travels uh, maybe in, in the fall for migration and it goes down to Texas or maybe to Central America or even farther south down into uh, South America and someone else catches it along the way or someone else catches it while they're down there. Uh, at that point we've learned a little bit about where these birds go, where they stop, where they spend time uh, and these are all important conservation issues because it's not just about uh, conserving the forest that we have here in Minnesota but it's also about conserving the spaces along the way uh, that these birds are using to migrate, to stop, to rest, to feed. It's also about conserving uh, the places where they're spending the winter uh, before they come back up here to Minnesota and spend the summers with us. So uh, these are uh, all important conservation pieces uh, that we can use uh, that we can gather uh, as we uh, learn more information about individual birds. So it, we have our blue jay. You can see him wiggling around in there. Uh, and I'm going to reach in and it takes me a little bit just to get them into the right position. I want to make sure that I'm handling this bird safely. Uh, and so uh, as I pull this bird out, you'll see that I have it gripped. Um, and this particular grip is called the Bander's Grip. Uh, for those of you that like to know the names of things, uh, the Bander's Grip is a grip where I have my fingers just very loosely around the outside of the neck. I'm not pinching or squeezing my fingers at all, uh, but it's just kind of holding it in place. Uh, if as a, uh, as a kid you ever got your head stuck between the um, banister railings uh, on a stair perhaps and kind of felt like you couldn't pull your head back out, that's a little bit of, of what this might feel like to a bird. But it's just a very safe hold uh, around the, the, um, the edge of the neck and the shoulders and it keeps that bird from moving around but also allows me to move uh, and handle this bird. Uh, in a way that's safe for that bird. So uh, we're going to do a number of things uh, here and I'll uh, try to talk you through them as we do them. Uh, one of the things that we're going to do is identify the species. We know that this is a blue jay. One of the things that's required uh, if you're helping out with a banding project or doing any bird banding is you need to identify the species. So we know that this is a beautiful blue jay. Uh, absolutely gorgeous coloration. Uh, you can see as I uh, extend the wing a little bit, you can see that beautiful blue color. Um, one of the very cool things about this particular bird, aside from the really striking coloration that it has, is that the blue color actually comes not from a blue pigment, right? So the color comes not from a, 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 some kind of a molecule that is blue, but in fact comes from a molecule that is brown. But the way in which those molecules, those pigment molecules, are organized inside the feathers, when the feathers grow, it reflects the light back to your eye and we see it as blue. I know that's a little bit complicated, but it's a really interesting uh, way of, of uh, coloring feathers. So, in fact, if we hold this up, and I'm not sure this is going to show up on camera, but if I hold this up to the light and we get light coming from behind instead of just coming this way and bouncing back to your eye, what you will see, right, is it's a little, maybe a little hard to see with the light the way it is. I'm going to actually turn and hold it up to the sun a little bit. You actually see that the feathers themselves are actually brown. Uh, so I'm not sure if you can see that or not. It's very easy to see when you do it um, in person, but um, it's a cool fact about blue jays. So they actually have brown feathers, but because of the way the light bounces off of their feathers, it appears to our eye to be blue. So uh, we know that this is a blue jay, uh, and in this particular case, we can look at uh, some feathers. Uh, well, I should say the second thing that we're going to uh, look at is um, 
the age of this bird. So there are three things that we're interested in. One is the species, two is the age, and three is whether it's a male or a female. Um, in some birds, like cardinals perhaps, you can pretty easily recognize whether it's a male or a female because there are big differences between the males and females based on the color of their plumage, right? The cardinal that we're familiar with, males are bright red, the females are a little bit browner, um, have a little beautiful reddish hue, but they're not uh, striking, uh, they're not as, as brightly colored. Whereas uh, with uh, blue jays, it turns out that you really can't tell the difference between a male and a female uh, based on just their colors. So in this case, we're actually not going to be able to know at this time of year whether or not uh, this is a male or a female. Now, a little bit later on in the summer and later in the spring when these birds are starting to nest, we can actually sometimes tell uh, whether it's a male or a female, and we can do that by blowing on its belly. And so when we blow on the belly, a female will have a big bear patch, um, and that's uh, because she loses the feathers in that area to help her to incubate uh, or to keep the eggs warm. Whereas a male and a lot of these birds won't have that bare patch because they don't do as much of the incubation or sometimes no incubation at all. So uh, in this particular case, uh, we're really not gonna be able to. It's pretty early. These birds are not yet sitting on eggs in most cases. So um, it's, it's pretty early to be able to tell. But maybe in another three or four weeks, if we were to catch this bird again, we would in fact be able to know if it's a male or a female. So maybe. Well, I'll be out here again, banding later this summer um, here at the park, and hopefully we'll be able to, to catch some of those birds um, that we catch today again. Uh, so we know that it's a blue jay. We don't know if it's a male or a female. Let's see if we can figure out how old it is. That's the third piece of information that we want to know. And in birds, uh, it turns out they really only have um, three birthdays, if you will, at least that we can identify. One of those birthdays uh, is the year in which they're born. So if a bird is born uh, in, a, in a given year, we know that they were born that year or hatched that year, so we call it a hatching year bird. Um, we know, because it's still early in the spring, that we uh, still don't have birds nesting. There's a few birds that are nesting right now, things like eagles, things like uh, great horned owls have nests already, but most of our smaller songbirds don't yet have nests. And so this is not a bird that was born this year. That leaves us with two options. Uh, we could have a bird that was born last year. Um, so this is its second year, uh, one year after it was born. So we call it a second year bird. Or we can have birds that we can tell are born previous to that or that are older than two years. And we call those after second year birds. And so um, it turns out that we can use a number of different things to identify the uh, potential age of a bird. Um, one of the most commonly used is uh, the, the coloration, the patterns, and the shape of the feathers that uh, these birds have. It turns out that as birds change their feathers or do what's called molt their feathers, uh, that uh, the shape and the color of those feathers changes as well. And so we can often tell this if this bird is a young bird or an old bird based on those feathers. Sometimes with some birds, we can also tell the difference between a hatching year bird and an older bird by things like eye color. Um, so I don't know if you can see uh, on this blue jay, <laughs> uh, but this blue jay has a beautiful brown eye. Uh, there's not a lot of other uh, coloration to it. Sometimes uh, with birds, uh, you'll also see, for example, on the inside of the mouth, and I'm going to do this uh, in a way that doesn't bother the bird very much, but you can see that the inside of the mouth is all black. Um, on a younger bird, uh, they're often yellow uh, or, or some uh, shade of, of lighter color, whitish, yellowish, orangish, uh, that will also be an indicator of age. So we know this bird was not born last or this year because uh, it's still too early. So it's at least two years old and it might be older than two years old. Um, and so then we start to look for other pieces of information. So in, uh, in this bird, uh, we actually have a feather. 
a group of feathers that are called the Alula, and that's out here on this outer edge. Um, and this is a cool set of feathers uh, for those of you that are really interested in birds. This set of feathers, when birds are landing, they actually can extend these out a little bit, and it helps to reduce the turbulence coming off of the wing. And so it helps them to fly and land uh, with more control and more safely. So there's a function to those feathers uh, when it comes to flying. But in this case, in blue jays in particular, it turns out that if we look at these feathers, we can use it as an age character. And so older birds, birds that are older than two years, will actually have nice blue alula feathers, which this bird does, but they will also have a lot of black barring on those feathers. And I don't know if you can see in the video, but there's just a hint of a little bit of black barring on these feathers uh, that um, tells me that this is a bird that was born last year. So this is a two-year-old bird, or what we call a second-year bird. So we've done what we need to uh, in terms of identifying what kind of bird it is, whether it's a male or a female, we don't know, and then whether or not it's a young bird or an older bird. So this is what we call a second year bird. And I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna put a band on this bird. Um, what I am using is a band that comes from uh, the Bird Banding Laboratory. The Bird Banding Laboratory is um, uh, part of the U.S. federal government and they regulate all bird banding activities in North America, especially in the United States, and they coordinate with Canada and Mexico as well. Uh, and they issue bands. Uh, I have to have a special permit to be able to do this. Uh, but they issue bands to me that are numbered and each of them is uniquely numbered. So when I put this particular band on the leg of this bird, this bird uh, will carry this band for the rest of its life. It doesn't hurt the bird. Um, I'll show you how I put it on here in just a moment, but it's going to carry this band for the rest of its life. So if I ever catch this bird here at the park or anyone else catches this bird anywhere else in Minnesota or wherever else it may fly, uh, we, we can use the number that is on this bird to be able to identify it at some point in the future. Um, each bird that we catch gets a band that is sized uh, exactly for the size of that bird. So we don't want to put a big band on a little bird or a little band on a big bird uh, because we want them to fit comfortably. And so uh, that's what I'm going to do. And so I use a special pliers. This is called a banding pliers. It's a little different than uh, maybe the pliers that you might have at home in your garage. But uh, this particular one has several different holes that are for the different sizes of bands. And I'm going to go ahead and slip that on this bird's leg. Uh, so I extend the leg again gently and then just squeeze that band together. And I want to make sure that that band is nice and flat. You can see that the seams of the band fit together nice and evenly. Uh, and so at this point that band slides nice and comfortably. It's not pinching the leg. It slides up and down nice and comfortably, but it won't go past the toes and it won't go past the ankle. So it'll always stay on this bird in that position. It's not going to bother that bird. It's not going to affect the ability of that bird to move around or eat uh, or fly. So um, we've gathered that information. One other piece of information that we gather from birds uh, before we release them is I measure what is known as the wing cord. And the wing cord is the distance between the wrist and the longest feathers on the, on the wing. And so we use this information because actually sometimes that information can help us to identify whether it's a male or a female. So even though this blue jay has uh, feather colors that don't help us know whether it's a male or a female, sometimes the wing cord can be useful. Uh, and so uh, in this case, the wing cord is 129 millimeters. Okay, so it's got a, it's a big bird. It's got big wings. Uh, and if I look that up in the guide that I have, I see that wing cords for females range between 115 and 139, and for males, 117 to 148. So 129 falls right in the middle of both male and female wing cords. So in this case, it actually doesn't help us. It's a little bit like uh, for people. If we were to uh, measure the heights of people, right? You would have some women who might be shorter than most men. You'd have some men who might be taller than most women, but most of us uh, overlap, right? There are taller women, there are shorter men. So that's true for this blue jay as well. So we still don't know whether it's a male or a female, uh, but we'll, um, we may find out later on this summer. So we have our wing cord. Uh, we have 
our bird is banded, we've aged it, we've identified it to species, uh, and we uh, are going to go ahead and release it. So I'm going to let this bird go, uh, and uh, we're going to hopefully capture that on film as it goes, uh, but it's probably going to want to take off very quickly. So when I let this bird go, uh, I'm not going to throw it up, I'm just going to let it fly off on its own. Uh, sometimes they're a little bit disoriented and they may sit there for a little bit, but uh, we'll see. <laughs> Perfect. 